everybody to this, I think, potentially very interesting and timely discussion. Uh, I'm Tony Brown, I'm founder member of the Institute and was for quite a long time <coughs> the chair of the project on the Balkans, uh, which I was looking back had a, a, a very long uh, list of, of events and publications and was a very intensive part of the work of the Institute. But unfortunately, a mixture of the recession and uh, a, a slowdown in, in uh, attention to the enlargement project and uh, a question of where our own resources should be devoted meant that that project uh, has ceased to be uh, a, a one of the, the frontline elements of the Institute's work. And of course, uh, we had the declaration of President Juncker at the very outset of his commission that there would be no enlargement during that mandate, which uh, put many things on the back burner, but not, I think, the interest of many people, including, I think, looking around this room, quite a lot of people who are here this afternoon uh, in both the issue of, of enlargement and also in the specific question of, of the Balkans. But in the last, what, three months, we've had two important statements uh, which bring the matter back towards the centre of the agenda. Uh, Juncker, in his this year's State of the Union address, spoke about enlargement at some length, indicating that it wasn't going to happen in this mandate, but almost inevitably it would be on the agenda of the next Commission. Uh, he did, in that, make a rather categorical statement about Turkey, which in the text that was issued appears in bold, basically that Turkey is unlikely to be a member in any foreseeable future. But he talked about the Western Balkans. And then Emmanuel Macron, in the Sorbonne speech, raised the, the, the Balkans issue specifically and talked about enlargement and then being basically an inevitable part of the next phase of the, of the Union's development. So when those two uh, presidents have brought these matters into the uh, discussion, uh, it's quite clear that they are going to be um, matters which we will have to give attention to in the period <coughs> ahead. And um, that being the case, it's, it was extremely timely that we, we made contact again with Erwin Fuere. Erwin has been a, a friend of this institute for many years. In fact, I look back, he is, this must be your fourth or fifth uh, visit going back uh, into the, the last decade. Um, time doesn't permit to deal with the, the full dimensions of, of your CV, but uh, Erwin has spent nearly 40 years in the service of the European Union, and particularly in the external service of the Union. And if you just, if one looks down the list where he has been, I mean, the, head of, the first head of the delegation to South Africa, first head of delegations in Mexico and Cuba, major role in, in the delegation for relations with Latin America, and then moving into the area that we're talking about today, um, and being uh, particularly um, special representative <coughs> in, in, in Macedonia. He's now, of course, uh, has left the, the, the EU service and is a senior associate of the <coughs> Centre for, Econo for European Policy Studies, SEPS, in Brussels, for which he does a substantial amount of, of research and writing. And uh, he's very much the man to bring us up to date on this and to show and, and to give us an insight in, in, into the situation in the Balkans, as it is today, uh, uh, an area of great strategic in interest, not least in, in matters such as uh, the migration issue for, for geo geopolitical reasons, and also uh, the, the politics of the relationship between that part of Europe and both Russia and China, and also something we've just been discussing the interesting relationships with Turkey. So, Warren, you're very welcome as always, and uh, we look forward to uh, 
hearing what you have to say. Before that, I realize I'm mandated to say certain things. First, to request that everybody disables or silences or whatever their various electronic communications devices. And secondly, that you note the fact that if there were to be an unlikely emergency, the way out is the way you came in. Um, but maybe a, a greater speed. Also that Erwin's presentation will be on the record, but the discussion and question and answer sessions will be subject to Europe House stroke Chatham House rules. You can use the information, but at your peril do you mention who said it or where they said it. And uh, having carried out my duties, over to you, Erwin, again, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to see many uh, good friends uh, around the table. I, I will start on a rather gloomy note, uh, but I will end on what I hope you will regard as a more positive, uh, hopeful note. Uh, many of us uh, in the think tank community uh, in Brussels and elsewhere who have been focusing on the Western Balkans and indeed uh, many, many people in the Western Balkans themselves uh, have felt that the EU has been neglecting uh, the Western Balkan region. Indeed, it has been taking it for granted. The argument being that because all the countries uh, of the region are destined for EU uh, accession, the reform process uh, will be on track like an automated train journey uh, guaranteeing stability uh, along the way. And it was only when uh, the EU High Representative, uh, Mrs. Uh, Federica Mogherini, travelled uh, to uh, the region in March of this year, uh, when she was confronted with the brutal reality uh, of uh, what was happening in the Western Balkans. For some of the countries, it was her first visit uh, uh, since she took up office in November 2014, even though it's Europe's nearest uh, neighbourhood. In Macedonia, for example, uh, she uh, saw for herself the, the very dangerous standoff uh, with the political crisis that had been going on for several years, while next door in Serbia she came face to face with uh, nationalist rhetoric which was more rem reminiscent of the Milosevic uh, era. So she reported back to the uh, ministers, to the uh, leaders uh, at the March uh, European Council uh, of last March. And if you read their, their conclusions, uh, you will see uh, where they refer to the fragile state, uh, fragile situation in the Western Balkans, and again reiterated the commitment of the EU towards accession of, of the countries, but that they had to do all the reforms and everything. And yet the warning signs that things were not well in the Balkans were there for quite some time. Uh, warning signs with regard to a deterioration in the democratic process, a parliaments that were not functioning, that were there to rubber stamp decisions, proposals put forward by the ruling parties, media uh, freedom which uh, was being constantly violated in some countries, journalists in prison, in others, uh, journalists being harassed, intimidated. <coughs> Civil society, similarly, and any of those who raised their voice above the parapet uh, to criticize the ruling parties were immediately uh, categorized as traitors, uh, and uh, whereupon then they were at the receiving end of armies of tax inspectors who would come to uh, look into their books, and then, of course, effectively preventing them from operating and from trying to uh, promote greater government accountability. So in all of these areas, uh, there was uh, a clear uh, deterioration spread over a number of years. Even the reports from Europol uh, highlighted the increasing trend in illicit trade, in, in traffic, uh, in uh, organized crime, in drugs, arms, and other illicit trade. And in the communication every year, except this year was an exception, the European Commission issues an enlargement uh, communication and progress reports in this country. And in this communication of November 2016, the European Commission set out uh, very clearly its concern. Uh, and it says uh, the, con uh, the region continuing to show clear symptoms and varying degrees of state capture. 
So this was probably the most categoric uh, recognition of a situation that was already uh, in existence for, for a number of years and was uh, reported also in the State Department, annual reports, OSCE, Council of Europe, etc. And unfortunately, these uh, alarming trends were accompanied by an increased uh, nationalist re uh, rhetoric reminiscent of the Balkan Wars of the 90s. And indeed, if you look at uh, some of those statements, you will see that some of the leaders have not hesitated to use the, the language of hatred and intolerance as if they were trying to perpetuate the wars by means other than armed conflict. Convicted war criminals were welcomed back as war heroes. Uh, you saw the uh, reaction from the Serbian Orthodox Church when uh, Vladko, uh, Radko Mladic was convicted and sentenced by the International Tribunal in The Hague. They said this was the work of the devil. So this was very much reminiscent uh, and reflective uh, of the uh, attitude of ruling parties uh, at the time and, and now, unfortunately. And even some... Uh, uh, convicted uh, war criminals who returned after their sentences were put on the candidates' lists of ruling parties in their elections. And unfortunately, this attempt at, at whitewashing the past and rewriting history goes deep down into society. In Bosnia and Herzegovina and Macedonia, for example, you have, uh, you have uh, incidents of uh, rewriting history of the school curricula being altered to bring in uh, the agendas of uh, ruling parties, and you have an increasing trend in segregated teaching between the different ethnic uh, communities. And this is despite the best efforts of the OSC High Commissioner for National Minorities, who has tried to uh, promote a more uh, integrated uh, education, more integrated multicultural education system uh, in these uh, countries, but the uh, damage uh, for many uh, of these communities has been done because if you have segregation of schools, you have exacerbation of tensions in society at large. Even the Commissioner for Human Rights of the Council of Europe, after his recent visit to the Western Balkans, he underlined, and I quote, his concern that reconciliation has stalled and is being superseded by mounting ethnic tensions and polarization in the region. What has been the reaction of the EU? Well, apart from the usual expressions of concern and exhortation to the leaders to maintain their commitment to the reform track and all that, the EU and the member states have given the impression of really underestimating the extent of the malaise in the region and simply not wishing to get involved. Some of these member states, of course, are member states where public opinion is very weak, are in a majority are not in favour of enlargement, so it's not something which leaders will mention. The less said on future enlargement of the EU, the better. And of course, so the, whatever messages were conveyed were more of a technocratic nature. Reforms, you must carry on with the reforms, etc., there were not really messages addressing the root causes of the malaise uh, in the region and the political deterioration uh, throughout society. And even the so-called Berlin process, as you know, Angela Merkel in uh, summer of 2014 launched this process ostensibly to mark the 100 years since the First World War, where, of course, you know, the Balkans featured so much. So it was one summit a year, for the next four, four years uh, to try to promote cooperation. And of course, that initiative came just a few months after the statement that you mentioned uh, of the President of the Commission saying that there will be no enlargement during, uh, during my uh, mandate. So even that Berlin process, which saw a summit of <clears throat> Western Balkans with a number of the EU, not all of them, uh, in Berlin 2014, in Vienna 2015, Paris 2016, and the last one in Trieste, hosted by Italy uh, in 2017, focusing on regional cooperation, but very, very little on the rule of law, fundamental rights, democratic standards, etc. 
It was as if the EU were using the argument that regional cooperation will solve all the rule of law problems uh, of, of their own. And it's quite clear that much more forceful uh, and consistent political message from the EU could have reversed or at least stalled the uh, backsliding, uh, but unfortunately that uh, did not happen. And even politi uh, political agreements that were mediated by the EU, such as in Macedonia, to try to solve the crisis, were not followed up because there was a lack of monitoring, proper monitoring and uh, enforcement mechanisms in place. And then the refugee crisis, which you mentioned in 2015, uh, where the, in particular the countries of the EU in the forefront, Hungary, Austria, sought to negotiate with the countries of the Western Balkans who were at the receiving end of this massive wave of refugees coming through Greece, uh, negotiating with them so that they will close their borders to prevent passage, even though many of these uh, refugees were refugees who were fleeing from a civil war in, in their own countries. And of course, the governments concerned, Macedonia and Serbia, were only too happy <coughs> to accommodate the, the, the requests from uh, notably Austria and Hungary, uh, who in turn uh, had no interest in uh, looking behind the curtain to see the increasing degradation in human rights and fundamental re uh, um, freedoms in, in those countries of the Balkans. Strong and stable governments uh, were the buzzwords of EU leaders at the time. <coughs> and you even had elected government officials from the EU, such as Prime Minister Orban or Foreign Minister Kurz from uh, Austria, going down to attend uh, political party rallies of those same ruling parties, even when one of them, uh, his leader, has been and is under criminal uh, investigations. So obviously the ruling parties saw no reason to change their behaviour and just uh, continued as before with even greater uh, impunity. <coughs> so faced with all this, it is quite clear that uh, there needs to be uh, a, a far greater effort by the EU to match commitment to the, to the <coughs> Western Balkans with action. So <coughs> you mentioned the statement of the President of the Commission, Juncker, in his State of the Union address to the Parliament last September, where he says, if we want more stability in our neighbourhood, then we must also maintain a credible enlargement perspective for the Western Balkans. And he added in his letter of intent, which is always, a, always accompanies the uh, statement, a, a phrase which says, uh, one of the priorities for the Commission in the next year, the preparation of a strategy for a successful EU accession of Serbia and Montenegro as front-runner candidates in the Western Balkans. So this was... Uh, manna from heaven in a way uh, to many of us who have felt that the Western Balkans was totally forgotten and was w warmly welcomed by the Western Balkans themselves even though only two countries were mentioned uh, in that. But it does, it does uh, underline that there is now finally a recognition that uh, there needs to be far greater attention uh, to the uh, Western Balkans uh, than, than heretofore. Uh, and uh, this is all the more important when one considers that the EU is not the only actor in the region at the moment. You have Russia, who is using uh, whatever influence it has through its soft power to uh, create problems, uh, and you saw their involvement, alleged involvement in the attempted coup in uh, Montenegro over a year ago. They were also very active during the crisis in Macedonia. You have Turkey, of course, increasing its influence, using its uh, cultural ties and its own particular brand of authoritarian rule. And then you have China, which uh, is increasing its investment imprint with its One Belt, One Road initiative, uh, and which is bringing a lot of investment, but it's not necessarily the investment which is to the advantage of the country's concern, because a lot of it is tied uh, aid. So the list of uh, initiatives we have now uh, is uh, looking, I must say, very uh, hopeful, very positive. Uh, and it comes at a time when I think uh, 
as I said, there really needs to be a far greater attention. And hopefully it will mean that the EU will have a much more hands-on, more determined approach towards its nearest neighbourhood, towards the Western Balkans, and also much greater visibility uh, in uh, the region uh, to uh, address the issues there. So I will take the initiatives one by one very briefly. So first of all, there is the strategy paper which was announced by Juncker, which will be presented on the 6th of February. Uh, it will be, we were told, a strategy paper co covering all of the Balkan region. But it will be the first uh, of many initiatives, so hopefully it will set the tone of what the EU's vision for the long term uh, for the Western Balkans uh, will or should, uh, should be. Uh, and I would hope that um, it will, of course, first of all, underline the broad principles of the EU integration process, which is the fundamental, fundamentals first, as the called, rule of law, uh, human rights, uh, democratic standards uh, should be at the heart of the accession uh, process. And th the paper should not shy away from pointing to some of the serious examples of deterioration and democratic standards. Um, it should, I hope, this paper uh, address the root causes of the malaise uh, in the region and come forward with some uh, really uh, very innovative uh, approaches. In other words, it should address the people, society in the Western Balkans, who have felt totally let down by their elected leaders, by this entrenched elite, uh, who uh, are more adept at strengthening their personal power than at uh, resolving the uh, many serious political and economic problems facing the uh, individual uh, countries. And many of these countries, I would say the vast majority, with possible except Serbia, have a, a, a still a very strong majority of support for accession to the European Union. So the paper should respond to that and should highlight the tangible benefits of, of EU accession and also try to put forward various ideas to prevent this phenomenon of state capture occurring again. I, I mentioned some innovative suggestions. I just mentioned two because I think they could help in uh, attacking the root problems. Education, first of all how to uh, create a climate to end the, the, this segregated teaching uh, between <coughs> different uh, ethnic communities. Uh, and uh, there's a lot that could be done there to help already existing civil society initiatives uh, in promoting uh, integrated and, and intercultural education, uh, particularly in multi-ethnic societies. Second uh, area, I think, of importance is reconciliation. As I mentioned, this real problem uh, worsening uh, in the region where uh, leaders are trying to whitewash the past or to rewrite history. So there are a number of initiatives because, as we know, and as Shaw knows from, from uh, South Africa, you cannot impose reconciliation on the outside. It has to come from uh, the inside in order to be successful. And so there are some very good initiatives, the RECOM initiative, which brings together civil society organizations from throughout the region to promote uh, a, a reconciliation process. And this could help in dealing with the transitional justice, which is so necessary. Now that the Hague Tribunal is closing its doors, uh, leaving a lot of evidence gathered, thousands and thousands of of uh, testimonials. <coughs> Hopefully this will help in dealing with the still many, many areas uh, that have not been addressed within each country uh, and where you have former victims who see every day still their former torturers or those who kept them in jail or those who raped them while they were in uh, camps uh, in the worst time of the, of the wars, which was only just over 20 years ago. And there, I think, we, the EU could help by financing uh, investigative experts, like it did for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. So it can do a lot of uh, assistance that can help in moving the reconciliation <coughs> process forward. 
A third area I think where the EU needs to be much more consistent is in its uh, relations with civil society and the media. And if you look at uh, the region, all of them are post-conflict societies. And it's quite clear that uh, in those countries, with the heritage of history, with weak institutions, the lack of or even uh, absence of um, the normal checks and balances that we take for granted, the contribution from civil society actors can be enormous in filling the gap and ensuring much greater government accountability. So the EU should be supporting civil society at all levels and at all times in order to uh, ensure this much greater exclu uh, inclusive approach uh, in dealing with the problems uh, there. Media as well. If you look, for example, in Macedonia, in the uh, Reporters Without Borders uh, Index, Macedonia was in the 34th place. Now it is in the 111th place. So it shows the dramatic degradation in uh, media. Uh, and there have been cases where the OSCE, uh, Freedom of the Media Representative, has spoken out against violations, but the EU has been silent. So there, there needs to be a much greater focus. And another important area is dealing with bilateral disputes. There are so many bilateral disputes within the region. Border demarcation issues, name dispute between Greece and Macedonia, minority issues, Greece not recognizing uh, the Albanian minority in Greece or Macedonian minority in Greece. A Bulgarian minority in, in uh, Serbia and Macedonia, vice versa. A, a lot of uh, bilateral problems which are plaguing the entire region. And the EU cannot pretend to support the EU perspective for the region if it leaves the responsibility for resolving these disputes to the countries themselves. Most of them lack the legal and technical expertise which could help them in finding solutions and yet solutions remain vital. So hopefully the EU there can use its own uh, experience and together with OSCE, Council of Europe, the Venice Commission, could put forward uh, some uh, proposals to help in addressing these bilateral disputes. Because if they were to say a condition that no country can join the EU until they have resolved their bilateral disputes, then I think it, it won't. It won't happen, and I think it will only exacerbate even worse uh, the problems uh, in the region. And again, their support for civil society can be very important, particularly in the cross-border uh, regions. I, I won't touch upon on the economic uh, reforms because I see I'm already running uh, beyond the time. Uh, but the last uh, report from the World Bank gives a, a fairly... Uh, positive picture saying growth uh, will rise from 2.6 in 2017 to 3.3 in 2018. But even if these growth figures are achieved, the level of uh, economic development uh, in the Western Balkans will not catch up with the average EU for at least 15, 20, 30 years. And of course, unemployment there is a huge problem. Uh, remaining and a lot of it is youth unemployment and that's why so many have left uh, the Western Balkans seeking uh, a life, make a new life uh, elsewhere. So the next uh, important uh, event is the enlargement communication from the Commission which will be presented on the 16th of April which will set out um, the progress report for each of the countries concerned uh, and um, we hope that um, it will include recommendations for the opening of accession negotiations with Albania and with Macedonia because of the progress there in the last few months and hopefully that will continue up to June and June is the Council, European Council which must then take the decision. Of course, for Macedonia, a big question is, will Greece accept negotiations to start before the name issue is resolved? As we speak today, there is a meeting in Brussels, the first in three years, with the UN mediator Matthew Nimitz, 
who has the patience of an archangel, and he is still uh, has been dealing with this for the past uh, 18 years. Uh, he read his uh, obituary, uh, he told me a few years back when I saw him in the newspaper, uh, 2025, a UN mediator found dead in a taxi um, uh, commuting between Thessaloniki and Skopje tried to resolve the name issue. <laughs> um, so, and then uh, we have the Western Balkan summit. This is the first summit in many years between the European Union as a whole and the Western Balkans, which will take place, hosted by Bulgaria and Sofia, in the second half of May. And hopefully that will also uh, emphasize the important messages of reforms and the commitment uh, from uh, the EU. Then I mentioned the June Council and the next uh, initiative, the next event on the calendar is already quite a lot uh, for the Western Balkans. The next event will be the uh, fifth uh, summit in the Berlin process. You remember I mentioned the four previous ones. And believe it or not, the next uh, Berlin Process Summit uh, with the Western Balkans will be hosted by the UK. Now, the irony of a country which is negotiating its exit from the EU, hosting a summit with countries that are negotiating their entry into the EU, uh, will not be lost on everybody. And we still are not clear uh, how and what they will focus on and everything. But my concluding point is that I do believe that uh, now with all of these initiatives uh, on the table that the EU will catch up and will demonstrate uh, a renewed commitment of support for the Western Balkans which will help in turn the reform uh, process in the country themselves so that they will no longer feel that they are being taken for granted and that there will be a much more determined efforts to achieve that uh, uh, reform agenda, which is so important for them, first of all, but also, of course, <coughs> is a condition for their accession uh, to the European Union. And I'm uh, cautiously optimistic that this will really will mark a, a change and a, a qualitative jump in the EU's commitment uh, towards the Balkans and will really make a big difference and will strengthen the, the, the sense of stability uh, in Europe's nearest neighborhood. And we mustn't forget that. It's just next door to the European Union. So um, progress in that area will help very much uh, within the European Union. But of course, we need to convince EU uh, public opinion uh, on the benefits of this enlargement. So I will end on that hopeful note. Thank you very much.